do you think that there are many complicated things happening during the neuromuscular blockade in fact it is as simple as having a coffee at your favorite hangout i am dr sanish inviting you to anesthesia tools for a coffee at the neuromuscular junction This is the all too familiar picture of neuromuscular junction where you can find the nerve ending and the motor end plate. Before we start off, please pause the video to identify the parts and then proceed. Now you can find an impulse or action potential reaching the nerve terminal. Now you can find the presynaptic calcium channel opening allowing calcium influx into the nerve terminal. This is the signal to proceed with exocytosis of vesicles containing acetylcholine. The vesicle reaches the terminal, it prepares to release acetylcholine into the neuromuscular junction and now acetylcholine gets deposited in the neuromuscular junction. The membranous component of the vesicles is taken back by the nerve terminal and repackaged with new acetylcholine. Inside the nerve, acetylcholine gets replenished by the enzyme choline acetyl transferase using acetyl-CoA and choline as its substrates. Here you can see acetylcholine diffuses across the synaptic cleft and binds with acetylcholine receptors located on the crest of the junctional folds of the postsynaptic sarcolemma. This binding elicits an influx of sodium across the sarcolemma at the end plate region resulting in an electrical depolarization that is initially restricted to the end plate region of the sarcolemma. This is an end plate potential that evokes an action potential that is conducted throughout the entire sarcolemma via the T tubular network which invaginate the muscle fiber. This is the excitation phase of the excitation contraction process eventually leading to muscle fiber twitch. Now let us go into how neuromuscular blocking drugs work. We are going to zoom in to the topic proper. Are you ready? Now onwards, we shall have more scientific picture of the acetylcholine receptor. As you can find here, when an agonist, here in our case acetylcholine, occupies both alpha subunit sites, the protein molecule undergoes a conformational change with a twisting movement along the central axis of the receptor that results in the opening of the central channel through which ions can flow along a concentration gradient. When the central channel is open, sodium and calcium flow from outside of the cell to the inside and potassium flows from the inside to the outside. The channel in the tube is large enough to accommodate many cations and electrically neutral molecules but it excludes anions like chloride. The current transported by the ions depolarizes the adjacent membrane, the net current is depolarizing and creates the end plate potential that stimulates the muscle to contract. The pulse stops when the channel closes by a reversed mechanical conformation which is typically initiated when one or both agonist molecules detach from the receptor. Now the channel is in the resting stage. Further, what happens to acetylcholine in the synaptic cleft? Choline esterase is the enzyme which cleaves acetylcholine into acetyl coenzyme A and choline moieties. 
the detached molecules get reabsorbed into the nerve terminal for replenishing acetylcholine inside the vesicles. Now the receptor sites are free. Fresh acetylcholine tends to occupy the receptor sites and again when both the sites are occupied conformational change occurs. Now again the channel is open. Depolarization happens due to cation transport. Acetylcholine then dissociates from the receptor and then cholinesterase enzyme cleaves it. Now acetyl-CoA and uh, choline moieties are separated. Now it is time to introduce neuromuscular blockers into the scene. It is shown as blue rectangle for illustration purpose. Our V-coronium, Rocuronium, Matracurium, Cisatracurium all are non-depolarizing relaxants. Non-depolarizing blockers antagonize the action of acetylcholine in a competitive manner at the postsynaptic nicotinic receptor. They do not produce conformational changes in the receptor. Binding to one or both alpha subunits prevents access by acetylcholine to depolarize the receptor. Here you can see that acetylcholine is denied receptor site to occupy with antagonist block there is a gradual reduction in the end plate potential until it fails to reach the threshold to fire off a propagating action potential to produce muscle contraction. Neuromuscular block expressed as depression of single twitch height only becomes evident when 70 to 80 percent of receptors are occupied by the non-depolarizing neuromuscular blockers to produce complete block at least 92 percent of receptors must be occupied. The binding of antagonists to the receptors is dynamic with repeated association and dissociation. If the concentration of acetylcholine is increased, it has a higher chance of occupying the receptor sites than the antagonist. However, cholinesterase keeps splitting acetylcholine, tilting the balance in favor of non-depolarizing blockers as long as it binds to the receptor firmly. Remember, non-depolarizing blockers like depolarizing drugs also exhibit desensitization block. They bind tightly to desensitized receptors and can trap them in these states. This is a non-competitive block. When more receptors are in desensitized state, the margin of safety of transmission is reduced. We will learn more about desensitization block a little while later. Now, how can you reverse neuromuscular blockade? When an inhibitor of acetylcholinesterase such as neostigmine is added, then the cholinesterase cannot destroy acetylcholine. Now, the concentration of agonists in the cleft remains high and this high concentration shift the competition between acetylcholine and the neuromuscular blocker in favor of the former, thereby improving the chance of two acetylcholine molecules binding to a receptor even though antagonist is still in the environment. You can find the increase in the number of agonist molecules. Again, remember that the channel opens only when acetylcholine attaches to both recognition sites. And now the channel conformation change happens and generation of end plate potential resumes. We add an anticholinergic drug along with neosipine for reversal, right? What is the reason? Acetylcholine is a parasympathomimetic agent which can act on the muscarinic receptors in the heart leading to bradycardia, in the stomach increasing gastric secretions, etc. Therefore, when you block the acetylcholine cleaving mechanism thereby increasing acetylcholine levels, we need to block the muscarinic effects by adding anticholinergic drugs like atropine or glycoperylate. We shall discuss regarding the timing of reversal and the dose, how much is effective rather enough in a separate video. 
after large doses of neuromuscular blockers cholinesterase inhibitors may be ineffective until the concentration of relaxin in the perijunctional area decreases to a lower level by the redistribution or elimination of the drug the novel drug sugamadex reverses neuromuscular blockade via cyclodextrin encapsulation here sugamadex is shown by red boxes i hope you have noticed it cyclodextrin encapsulation takes place at any concentration of a steroid based compound such as vicoronium or rocuronium reversal by this novel mechanism can therefore be achieved at any level of neuromuscular block provided the amount of sugamadex or cyclodextrin is large enough the agonist acetylcholine can now occupy both receptor sites and produce muscle twitch again now we shall go to depolarizing blockers the classic example being succinylcholine the compound consists of two acetylcholine molecules that are linked by their acetyl groups it can also be viewed as a central moiety of succinic acid with two choline moieties one on each end the two quaternary ammonium radicals bind to the two alpha subunits of one nicotinic receptor and depolarization occurs initially when voltage sensitive sodium channels sense membrane depolarization as a result of activation of acetylcholine receptors they first open the channel and thereafter close and become inactivated the membrane potential must be reset before the sodium channels can be reactivated here is the sketch of the sodium channel cross section the bars v and t represent parts of the molecule that act as gates gate v is voltage dependent and gate t is time dependent in the resting state v is closed while t is open active state we can see v opens when the surrounding membrane is depolarized to allow ion flow T closes soon afterwards to inactivate the channel. Now coming to inactive state. V remains open while T is closed. This state is maintained as long as the surrounding membrane is depolarized. The channel reverts to the resting state when the membrane repolarizes. Now we know the membrane potential must be reset before sodium channels can be reactivated this is a very rapid process with acetylcholine as it is hydrolyzed by acetylcholine esterase within the synaptic cleft however succinylcholine is not metabolized by acetylcholine esterase so a prolonged activation of the acetylcholine receptors is produced the sodium receptors at the end plate and the perijunctional zone remain inactivated and junctional transmission is blocked the muscle becomes flaccid recovery from phase 1 block occurs as succinylcholine diffuses away from the neuromuscular junction down a concentration gradient as the plasma concentration decreases it is metabolized by plasma choline esterase previously called pseudo choline esterase now the acetylcholine receptor is back to resting state depolarization block is also called phase 1 or accommodation block and is often preceded by muscle fasciculation this is probably the result of the prejunctional action of succinylcholine stimulating the acetylcholine receptors on the motor nerve causing repetitive firing and release of neuromuscular transmitter how does succinylcholine action terminate recovery from phase 1 block occurs as succinylcholine diffuses away from the neuromuscular junction down a concentration gradient as the plasma concentration decreases it is metabolized by plasma cholinesterase 
previously called pseudocholinesterase. What are the effects of prolonged exposure to succinylcholine? It may be desensitization block or phase 2 block. Desensitization occurs when acetylcholine receptors are insensitive to the channel opening effects of agonists including acetylcholine itself. Receptors are in constant state of transition between resting and desensitized states whether or not agonists are present. In the figure you can find the receptor in the resting position with agonists bound to the recognition sites but channel not yet opened. Active state with open channel allowing iron flow and desensitized state without agonist and desensitized state with agonist bound to the recognition site are seen in the picture. Agonists do promote the transition to a desensitized state or trap receptors in that state as desensitized receptors have a high affinity for them. Normally acetylcholine is hydrolyzed so rapidly that it has no potential for causing desensitization. Desensitization block may be a safety mechanism that prevents overexcitation of the neuromuscular junction. Phase 2 block differs from desensitization block. It occurs after repeated boluses or a prolonged infusion of succinylcholine. In patients with atypical plasma cholinesterase, phase 2 block can develop after a single dose of the drug. The block is characterized by fade of the train of Fortich response, tetanic fade and post tetanic potentiation which are all features of competitive block. After the initial depolarization, the membrane potential gradually returns towards the resting state even though the neuromuscular junction is still exposed to the drug. Neurotransmission remains blocked throughout. Possible explanations for the development of phase 2 block include presynaptic block reducing the synthesis and mobilization of acetylcholine, postjunctional receptor desensitization, and activation of the sodium potassium ATPase pump by initial depolarization of the postsynaptic membrane which repolarizes it. Inhalation anesthetic drugs accelerate the onset of phase 2 block. Acetylcholine esterase drugs can be used to antagonize it but the response is difficult to predict. Therefore, it is advisable to allow spontaneous recovery. The fascinating journey of neuromuscular blockers will continue beyond coffee at neuromuscular junction. It's been my pleasure making this coffee at Neuromuscular Junction. Hope you enjoyed the video. I do look forward to your comments and suggestions. My email is sanishpj at yahoo.com. This video also features in my website www.onlineanesthesiatools.com. Until we meet next time, it's goodbye from Sanish.